All right, ladies and gentlemen, back today with somebody. We're going to be talking about psychology. We're going to be talking about neuroscience. We're going to talk about the marriage of both. Uh, we've got Associate Professor of Psychology from the University of Chicago, Greg J. Norman. How are you doing, sir? Pretty good. How are you doing, Chris? Not too bad. Did I did I botch the intro? Was that accurate, fair assessment? No, that was good. That okay. was accurate. I'm actually reading off the thing, so I, hopefully I don't go too far. So, so yeah. So, how did you? Obviously, these are two kind of separate but similar fields. You got your, you know, neuroscience, and you got your psychology. Mm -hmm. What was your journey in becoming yeah. interested in the human mind? Yeah. So it, it initially started with, as you said, with trying to better understand the mind. So, I, you know, my like so many other people, uh, my background wasn't necessarily an academic background. I was an athlete uh, uh, before I. Uh, became an academic. And one of the things that always interested me is how do people like deal with failure? How do they push through difficulties? What makes some person quit and another person keep trying? So uh, towards the end of my uh, career as a track and field athlete at Ohio State, uh, I ended up getting injured, which really put a, uh, was a big downer for me and ended that career. Um, it wasn't much of a career to begin with, but, and realizing that, you know, I needed to probably do something else besides running a straight line as fast as I can. Um, you know, really just, you know, going in and, and trying to figure out topics that, that particularly interested me and, you know, things like motivation and, and perseverance were really, uh, uh, you know, things that are interested in. So that was my initial kind of introduction to psychology. And then as soon as I uh, started taking the courses and, and joining labs, it became clear to me what I'm, what I'm really interested in is the connection between the mind and the body or the mind and the brain. How do thoughts translate into blood pressure changes? Uh, how do, you know, the way I'm thinking about some future event change the way my immune system is behaving right now? That really has always been something that's, uh, uh, you know, since then grabbed my uh, uh, interest. And um, so that's really where it started, where, you know, fundamentally the mind's coming from the brain. So if you want to understand the mind, one of the most important things you have to do is understand the kind of the machinery of the mind, which is the brain. Do the people in both fields work together well, or are there contentions between the two groups? I'm not even sure the people within each field uh, work together well, necessarily. No, I'm just, <laughs> uh, you know, I think one thing that it's kind of a confusing time because I, you know, we're in a weird sort of transition stage where for the most part, most individuals, not, you know, the a majority of individuals doing uh, uh, psychology are also, you know, kind of have one foot in the kind of neuroscience realm, uh, you know, whether it's imaging or, or, you know, whether it's kind of non-invasive measures or animal models. And the same is true for you know, a lot of neuroscience work where you're, you know, you can get a good grasp on what the brain is doing. But fundamentally, if it, you want to expand that to how does that translate to behavior? How does that translate to kind of social interaction, these sorts of things? So I think, you know, really, it, it's an interesting time to be studying both because whether you're a psychologist or a neuroscientist, at some level, you it's becoming more and more common that you have to almost be a little bit of both. Yeah, which I, makes it interesting. It's yeah, it certainly I, makes it complicated. I mean, the brain is complicated enough. Uh, it, we certainly don't need to be throwing more complexity in there. But um, you know, at some level, it, it helps actually make make the story a little bit simpler of understanding. You know, how a story goes from. Uh, you know, something from social interaction all the way down to kind of a more micro level. If if we want to understand that, we have to understand all of the uh, kind of processes and we're going right through mental, you know, neural, physiological. So, you know, it's it's certainly complicated, but that's what makes it fun. Yeah, I would think psychology used to be a guessing game, but now it would go hand in hand. Uh, do you feel like there's still a lot of mystery left in in both fields? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends a little bit what we mean by uh, a mystery. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a pretty safe bet. I mean, we are just scratching the surface uh, for both psychology and neuroscience. I think, you know, the past couple decades, there's been some tremendous uh, kind of advances in both fields. And in particular, the integration of these fields, along with, you know, uh, sociology or immunology, the kind of interdisciplinary work. But I think what what is pretty clear is that we are just, uh, you know, finally starting to really dig in and just scratch the surface. And I'll, I think there's uh, every reason to believe uh, the majority of big findings in both of these fields are, are in the future, which is which is an exciting time to uh, kind of uh, be a researcher on these topics. Yeah, I'm excited to see. I'm waiting to see if, uh, the, if we can heal our bodies <laughs> with our minds in the future. Or something. We had a gentleman sure, who's coming sure. on in the next uh, day or so. He has mapped out, using artificial intelligence, mapped out the fruit fly brain. And I thought, there you go. well, that's cool. 
Next, it's going to be us. Yeah, very, absolutely. Um, so you, your research also is, is focusing on physiological processes and the underlying relationship between social interaction and health outcomes. Now, so can you take me sure. through? This is, uh, this is like, you know, people who live longest uh, are the ones that have the best community or something, right? Yeah, related to that. So a lot of my work, uh, you know, is kind of in the in between. Those are kind of the bookends. So, you know, fundamentally, uh, usually when I uh, when I pitch this, I, you know, I study stress. I'm interested in how uh, humans or, or non-human animals uh, kind of operate under different kind of extreme conditions or different sort of pressures. And so in this context, you know, when we're thinking of the, the kind of social part comes in, because for highly socially interdependent species like humans, the majority of our stressors come from the social environment, right? So it's one of those to where, you know, that's what makes humans, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I mean, uh, that's why we've kind of conquered the world, whether or not we want to think of that as a good thing or a bad thing. It's not necessarily because of, you know, a bunch of individuals being really smart and doing things. It's, it's our capacity to integrate and kind of work together. So in order to maintain that kind of complexity, what our brains have to do is constantly track those relationships constantly try to, uh, you know, judge what future relationships are going to be, what we need to do now. And that's really where the stress part comes in, because we tend to uh, stress about things that matter to us. And there really aren't, there are very few things that matter to us more than uh, our, our social environment. So that's really where that social part comes in, because for humans, that's the source of, of the majority of our, our stress, um, uh, you know, both good and bad. And so that's really where, we, you know, if we want to understand how stress operates in humans and we want to understand the connection between the mind and physiology, uh, really, we got to understand the kind of social environment, the brain and the physiology altogether. Do you, do you suppose that historically this has also changed over time? Uh, the more modern uh, society gets, the more complex our kind of uh, w social worries become? Yeah, it's it's hard to say. I mean, it's one of those to where it, it's easy to answer that because it's not like we can go back, uh, you know, 100,000 years and, and get the answer. I, I would say, you know, the one thing that is clearly different is we have more access to stimuli that would be capable of generating uh, these sort of social stressors, you know, if we're talking about you know, things like social media. I think the things we are stressing about probably aren't, you know, dramatically different than what humans have stressed about in the past. But I do think you, you are right. The environment, and especially recently, is changing pretty significantly to where, you know, we're having to deal with, uh, you know, virtual social environments, uh, kind of hybrid, you know, knowing people uh, face to face and then having friends that we primarily just have through virtually and all the kind of difficulties and complexities that go in with that. So, yeah, I mean, I would say the the things we worry about tend to be, you know, pretty, pretty much the same over time. But I think the kind of uh, the uh, the amount of stimuli that we have to worry about now is is pretty it's it's impressive at some level right. that we're able to handle it um and yeah i would that's what i see as long as far as uh, social media and typing you know t being in a typing relationship rather than a face-to-face -face relationship we're missing out on all these great right. visual cues and face face expressions and body language and stuff and i think yeah oh, god you have to do a lot of projection you have to make so many assumptions about what's going on in, in someone else's mind and as we all know even when you're face to face with someone that you know really well we're not very good at that. Um, like what the uh, hell we, was we that make mistakes all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm speaking for myself then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so can you tell me how, what, how do you do a research if, into uh, social interaction and versus health outcomes? What's your process? Yeah. So again, you know, what you know, the epidemiologists and, and uh, the researchers that kind of work uh, directly on those health outcomes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful for them because they've kind of demonstrated the very strong link between one's perceptions of one's social environment and those health outcomes. So much of my work is kind of in the middle, trying to understand uh, kind of more mechanistically, what are the psychological and, and physiological processes that are, are maybe generating uh, that connection between the social environment and health. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways uh, that, that one can study that. One of the standard things that we do, given that we are primarily interested in stress, is we bring uh, research participants into the lab and uh, have them undergo different types of uh, social stressor. So whether, which, you know, for humans, it's that, not that difficult. Uh, you know, something like public speaking is one of the most stressful things that uh, uh, we can do. So we use, uh, you know, some, some variants of some tasks that basically require participants to do a public speech in front of 
uh, uh, what they think are uh, other professors or other students that are judging them really hard. And we kind of uh, set the prompt up so there's no way they can be prepared. So basically what they're being asked to do is, is give us public speech in front of people that matter uh, when they don't have the, the sufficient information to kind of execute that. And so whether or not you're a great public speaker, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, at some level in those contexts, uh, it's very, uh, it, you know, it's very easy to induce a pretty strong stress response there. So that's, you know, uh, one example of an experimental manipulation that we might use. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? It's like you, you're stripping their clothes off at the last minute while they're at the podium and saying, all right, now you're naked. <laughs> now do it. Sure. <laughs> we haven't went that far. I mean, that's a, maybe future research, right? <laughs> yeah. But no, some, uh, for me, I, public speaking, I, I love the challenge of trying to be a, you know, bullshit. Well, <laughs> I'm about to say, but most people sure. are just <laughs> horrified by the idea. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so in the, well, you, and you know, I think some of the trickiness goes to, like the, the, it's the perception of control. Like you, you know, when it's a challenge and you think there's hope, right. That maybe you can prepare for it and, and all of that, it's still stressful, but people can overcome it, but you can imagine, you know, just dropping in, uh, on an important speech that you don't even know what you're supposed to talk about that, that perception of lack of predictability and control is really what ramps it up for him. Yeah. Most people don't realize that a good performance, which is public speaking and any other kind of performance, is largely, uh, you know, based on bullshit and how good of a bullshitter oh, you are, and sure, uh, and whether or not the people will believe it because it's you know it's show business in a way. Uh, that's right. I, I, you know, I think that's right. And the better you know, it's some, it's kind of a little bit of a curse, right? Because the people who are you know the type of bullshit where you're able to get up and speak. You know, you're, the content isn't necessarily bullshit, but what you're bullshitting is that you're not nervous, that you're totally comfortable talking in front of this audience and, you know, uh, making these claims, doing this X, Y, and Z. The, the better you are at that, I think it's a weird thing that happens. The more likely it is that kind of the younger individuals that are looking to do that in the future just think, oh, that must come easy to them. Um, you know, it's, it's natural. They don't even have to work at it. But, uh, you know, high quality bullshitting is pretty, pretty yeah. hard to pull off. Break, breaking <laughs> with your confidence if you break confidence even though it, it could be feigned it could be fake it could be whatever but if you break the confidence the audience thinks this guy doesn't know what mm -mm. the hell he's talking about that's right they're just waiting for you to screw up more <laughs> that's really all it is absolutely but, but you yeah. have like business guys that are really good at just being on all the time even if they're just snakes you know um sure <laughs> that's right that's right uh, yeah. so you also it is a performance though yeah, you, i think yeah, you're you exactly are, right yeah yeah and this i mean i i, I know a little bit about performance uh, uh play a little yeah. bit of music <laughs> in my day sometimes you feel a little sweaty little little nervous but um you have to overcome sure. that somehow. but uh, i want to ask you about your publication about the impact of stereotype threat on brain activity during memory tasks mm -hmm. in older adults can you explain what this is and what what did you find about this and what's the implications Sure. Yeah, that, that's a, a recent study that um, it came out of a, a collaborative lab, uh, Professor Dave Gallo here at University of Chicago. And so the, one of the primary questions we had is on this topic of stereotype threat, which is basically, you know, we're all aware of stereotypes. In this case, uh, you know, the, the primary stereotype of interest would be just older individuals having memory problems, right? That's a pretty uh, common one. And the, the kind of basic question generally is, if you prime individuals with that idea or just remind them that older individuals have worse memory, is that sort of thought, that threat that kind of bubbles up in their mind, how much of an impact does that have on their behavior or their performance in a task? Uh, you know, uh, not over the top exciting for this paper, what we found in, uh, in that particular study was it didn't have as much of a kind of a, a, a kind of a, an impact on their memory performance uh, at, at a group level. Uh, basically, what we found is that sort of task, primarily the individuals that were impacted by it were kind of the the more well-educated individuals that instead of it being more of a kind of a disadvantageous response to the stereotype threat, uh, that sort of prime uh, of that, uh, you know, older individuals having poor memory uh, at some level just kind of activated, a, we can think of it as almost like a more conservative approach. So, uh, you know, at some level, what we found in, in that study was the stereotype threat wasn't particularly uh, uh impactful in that in that uh, uh population would you think it's uh, uh for some people it's it's also like a challenge and they cut rise to the the occasion say no i'm not old yep. and i can remember stuff and then they try harder and then sure. others just get defeated by it and go i guess i'm old yeah i think that's i i think that's right and i you know i think that ties a little bit into one of the things that you know have always uh, really interests me in the topic of stress is 
you know, a lot of almost all of, of stress that, you know, we, we might be dealing with on a day to day boils down to, you know, how we're framing it or how we're perceiving it. And like you just said, even if you and I are exposed to identical stressors, if I think I, you know, if I think I have the resources to meet that demand of that stressor, it's still going to impact me, right? I'm still going to have a stress response, but the flavor of that stress is very different. It might even be exciting. I might be challenged. Like you said, I'm, you know, certainly a more active approach, whereas individuals that, you know, in, in the case of the stereotype that might believe it might be like, Oh, I knew it. You know, I knew my memory was going bad or they don't feel like, uh, you know, they have the resources to meet the demand. They can have an entirely different stress response. And the primary thing that's varying there, uh, that's driving the variance in physiology, immune function, uh, your brain activity, all of that is just fundamentally how we perceive our exposure to that threat, whether or not, uh, you know, we have the resources to do anything about it, how controllable and predictable. So for me, that's really one of the kind of like, like you were pointing out, one of the more interesting things is no matter who we are, each individual is going to respond to the same stressor in different rain, uh, in different ways. In fact, the same individual responds to the same stressor in different ways, depending on time of day or time of week or time of year, even so that that sort of variability that you pointed out is exactly what I find most interesting. Yeah, I would think everything from genetics, the beginning of before you were born, then experiences you had, and then at that moment, whether or not you've got other stresses in your life. Uh, I, people, That's right. People can rise to the occasion better and faster and harder if if they have some better, uh, you know, things in their back pocket, on the back burner in their life where they think, well, you know, it gives you this more say la vie attitude about uh Sure, that's right. Taking and and I think you know that's why you know like, you know when I when I teach courses on on stress, one of the things I try to point out is, I mean, generally stress isn't good or bad. It's you know it's it's it certainly would be bad if we didn't have stress responses to stressors. But you know one of the primary things that uh, determine kind of maladaptive versus adaptive stress response are things like coping strategies. Uh, like you're saying, in your back pocket. Have you prepared or, you know, or, or do you have resources that you can lean on uh, under stressful conditions? Uh, you know, what is your general approach when a stressor occurs? Are you going to take an active sort of approach to try to address it? Are you going to try to avoid it? Those sort of coping strategies in many ways are the determining factor on how that individual or whether that individual is going to have what we might think of as a, a healthy or unhealthy stress response. Uh, and it's a little bit less dependent on the stressor itself. Of course, there are plenty of stressors that it doesn't matter what your coping uh, strategy is. You're, you know, it's, it's not going to be great. But for the most part, most of the stressors that we deal with the primary uh, variable that's that's making it either maladaptive or adaptive is again the, those sort of coping strategies and how we're framing it, which gives you know at some level that's a good thing. That's certainly more moldable and adaptable than like you know you were just born with th these genes and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, it begs the question: a guy that's so smart like you that knows all this stuff, what's your coping strategies when stress comes around? Uh, bullshitting? No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's still still working on them. Certainly, I, I think you know a couple things that I I do that you know are kind of weird. Is I have to do things like uh you know write myself notes to remind myself uh what to think about when, you know when you're when you're really feeling overwhelmed. That that comes from uh you know weird sort of things that I did as an athlete. That a lot of athletes um you know you have to do some weird things to get through those stressors. To where what I found as an athlete, and I still find it uh you know as a professor is Really, when we feel overwhelmed, the the the, the knee part or the uh, certainly not interesting part when you're going through it is you can't see what you can see uh, at other times, right? You basically catastrophize. It feels like you know the the clouds are are falling in on you, and so just reminding yourself that how you see the world or how I see the world, you know, when I'm feeling that sort of pressure is is at some level an illusion. Um, if I just wait it out and keep doing what I'm doing in a day or uh, you know maybe a little bit longer. I'll get back to seeing that, you know, it's a, it's a stressor. It's not pleasant. Um, I might have to do a lot of work to, to deal with it, but by no means is it, you know, the, you know, uh, apocalypse or the sort of end of the world, which is for everyone. Uh, when we get overwhelmed, that's how it feels. It just, it's for every single person. When we feel that way, it's almost like we're getting locked in and we can't see out. And so, you know, that's one coping strategy to make sure I don't make uh, silly decisions, uh, under those circumstances, because I can't kind of see out and just remind myself, give it a little time and, and you'll be fine. But, you know, sort of other things of trying as much as possible, you know, when possible to take an active uh, sort of coping strategy. So when there's a stressor coming my way, trying, if, if possible, not to avoid it, to try to directly address it. And then also, I think, um, reminding myself that failure is just part of how this goes. I mean, it's not it's not really the end of the world. We all fail, uh, you know, uh, pretty frequently, as long as it's not like 
the big capital F failure or, you know, you're embezzling money or making data up or something. For the most part, everyone's doing it and, and you get a lot of people respect when you fail and kind of bounce back. So, uh, you know, just kind of this focusing on all the things we tend to kind of overemphasize when we're feeling overwhelmed and reminding ourselves everyone else is dealing with it. And we've dealt with it in the past and we've been fine. And uh, there's every reason to believe moving forward in the future, as long as we stick to the plan, things will flush out, even if we can't necessarily see the end in the moment. Um, that's, you know, things will work out okay as long as we stick to the plan. Yeah, and what do you think, like, uh, stuff like mantras that help that just tell yourself certain things? I'm doing the best with what I have at this very time, or be here now, and things like this. I, Arnold Schwarzenegger had the motivational tape where he said, if you're, if you're not getting enough sleep at night, just sleep faster. And I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've watched that. Yeah. If yeah. only that were, that were true. I mean, yeah. it's pretty um, good though. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think most people operating at a, you know, at a pretty high level, what, what that means is they're in a, you know, pretty decent state of having to constantly push themselves outside of their comfort zones, which, you know, for a lot of individuals that, you know, that sort of mantra, uh, is a good thing. And what it also does is replace kind of the intrusive thought mantra that might otherwise be there of like, you're an idiot, what are you doing? You're going to fail um, of just replacing that with something a little bit more positive and, and hopefully accurate. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for it. You know, whatever, you know, whatever it takes within healthy bounds uh, to kind of keep individuals at their best. Uh, yeah, absolutely all for it. If I, I wish I could take Arnold's uh, advice and just sleep faster, but uh, I haven't mastered that one yet, but I'll maybe keep trying. Yeah. We'll have to, I'll try, I'm going to try it tonight. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> your research also includes psychophysiology and behavioral genetics. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how does this all tie back into these other things? Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, just given the description that I'm, I'm a sucker for is the, those kind of integrative fields. So, uh, you know, I'm trained as a psychophysiologist uh, and a behavioral endocrinologist uh, from graduate school. I did my training as a postdoc in John Cassiopo's lab, who was a, a social neuroscientist. And so, you know, the way that I think of it is how these all these different uh, pieces fit together is kind of like I was saying earlier, if you want to really fundamentally understand what's going on in an organism like a human, uh, it, you know, especially uh, in complex circumstances, we're putting blinders on if we only study just the psychology or just the genetics or just the physiology. It leads us, I mean, that's that works, uh, you know, historically it's worked and certainly uh, we need, we continue to need lots of individuals uh, kind of focusing on those uh, more narrow topics, but to get a kind of bigger picture and, and uh, better understanding of, uh, in this case, humans, we really have to understand how those topics fit together. So one of the things I've always been interested in is not just understanding, you know, psychology or just understanding physiology, uh, you know, in their own right, but how do these different theories and methods and, and sort of ideas in those fields, how do they mesh together? Because if it, if we're doing it right, uh, you know, they better fit. Um, and when they don't fit together well, you know, at some level, that's almost, uh, you know, a, a, a cheat code to where as soon as they stop fitting together, well, you know, at least something's off. Uh, something's wrong. <laughs> So yeah, that's right. And so it's one of those, so it's, it's without that, uh, it's much easier to kind of really feel like you got a firm understanding on, on your one sort of measure. But as soon as that measure goes in another context, you know, things get a little tricky. And so, it, you know, really what I like is, is trying, it's hard and very difficult, but trying to understand how all of these complex systems are, and, and theories are, are fitting together to make the whole that we, that we think of as humans. So you are, you just said social endocrinologist, is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can blur them all together. Um, yeah, but this is, very yeah, so, um, what is this? This is relating to the behavior you're getting from hormones or something. That's right. So, and yeah, in grad school, I worked in a behavioral endocrinology lab, which is basically understanding the relationship between behavior and, and hormones. Um, and so, uh, and a lot of the behavior that I was, uh, primarily interested in was social behavior. Um, so, uh, you know, understanding the interrelationship, the bi-directional relationship between, uh, uh, social behavior, even things like, uh, you know, social stressors in mice or social isolation, how that impacts hormones like, uh, you know, we might think of corticosterone or cortisol or estradiol or testosterone and, and better understanding how those two interact. And that's really, you know, that grad school experience uh, working in animal models of stress is really what uh, got me particularly interested in humans, because even at the level of a mouse, which is, you know, a pretty you know, if we think of the, like maybe the lowest common denominator of mammals when it comes to intellect, uh, 
at some level. They're capable of, of having very complex stress responses uh, that are context and socially dependent that, you know, certainly impact health outcomes. And so what really was clear to me doing that sort of work was if that's happening at the level of a mouse, uh, I can't even imagine what's happening at a, a, you know, at the level of a human mind. And so, yeah, uh, understanding uh, kind of behavior and, and hormones down at that level is really what helped propel me to uh, uh, become really interested in how are all those factors interacting at the level of a human and society. So it's things like blood pressure, you know, that's one of the uh, things that can af affect a stress response, but it seems like most sure. of it would be endocrine uh, driven, right? Your stress response. Well, it's so yeah, I mean, it really, I, I think, I mean, it, I don't know. I mean, I think the one way to think of it is uh, when we're thinking of even just standard stress responses, we have like just about every system in the body is reactive, right? So I think, you know, the hormonal stress response tends to be a little bit slower. It tends to be, uh, you know, uh, associated with more kind of structural changes, more kind of a little bit more intermediate and long term. But when we're thinking of like very rapid millisecond to second stress responses, a lot of that is being driven by, you know, in addition to behavior, the autonomic nervous system, which is kind of the hardwired system going from the brain right to the organs, which is uh, now what a lot of my lab focuses on is better understanding the, the relationship between stress and the autonomic nervous system. But then even, you know, the immune systems activated, uh, uh, you know, all of these different factors, it's, it's really hard to look at a particular system that's not changing its behavior in response to stress. So I think in the past, it was very easy to think of, you know, stress is just really cortisol. It's just this one hormonal uh, uh, sort of response. I think what we what we understand now is certainly cortisol's, you know, a, a central player in the stress response. But if we really want to understand the complexity of the stress response, and it's particularly complicated, um, we have to understand the orchestra of all of these stress response systems and their kind of time dependent manner. So I, you know, at some level, it's hard to pick which one's the most in, uh, kind of important there. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly, you know, when we're thinking of stress, the autonomic nervous system and things like the HPA axis and cortisol are two of the, uh, certainly make the top of the list of the most important. So if you in, or induce a stress response for a long enough period and you know, you, you're releasing hormones and, and, and having these reactions over time, can you, can this get embedded into your DNA and can you pass that on? Or is, is this outside your wheelhouse <laughs> or I'm just wondering. Uh, yeah, you? this is, so I can, you know, hopefully you don't mind me. Yeah, this is not uh, that question, right? It's not something <laughs> yeah. that I uh, study in particular, but yeah, I, it's certainly plenty of work showing that and it, again it has to be you know it's one of those where we don't want to think just you know i had a bad day and i'm gonna somehow pass that on to to future generations it, it takes a huge amount of stress happening for a very long period of time um but in, in those sorts of contexts yeah absolutely you can get the epigenetic uh changes so it's not necessarily reprogramming one's genome but it's uh through kind of chemical alterations of how uh the kind of environment is interacting with that genome changes the way that genome uh, uh, kind of works. So you can pass that kind of down to your offspring uh, through these kind of epigenetic uh, uh, pathways. So it, it's pretty wild stuff. Yeah, that's probably why everybody in my family is just stressed out all the time. Yeah, you um, can blame your ancestors. There you yeah, go. God, Mine too. God. I feel like I'm, if I, I just blame my ancestors, certainly I can blame my parents, but um, yeah, they'll, they'll probably want me to blame my ancestors. <laughs> Uh, what do they say? Shit r runs downhill. That's that's true. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've talked to a lot of neuroscientists, and all of them are pretty excited about AI. Uh, in sure. fact, a lot of people are excited about AI. I'm using it all the time. Um, can you describe how you're using it uh, in your research if at all, and what are you excited about as far as uh, technology changing to help tell you more interesting things about the mind? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I can. You know, it's it's one of those to where we we're not like right now it's not the centerpiece of uh of any sort of research project that you know i can uh, hopefully if we do it right pretty soon uh we'll be using it kind of on a, on a more regular basis to help us sift through all of the data but i can say even you know even if we're just talking about like just basic like chat gpt it's it's really changed the way i even uh you know do you know read papers or integrate sort of ideas uh it's really been a game changer even on that front of just organizing thoughts and kind of putting things together um, or, you know, helping kind of to connect different papers uh, sort of across the board. So I think, you know, even in the past couple months of just kind of learning to interface with it, I, you know, it's one of those, I can't even imagine living in a world without it. And that's just having it help uh, kind of basically be a, 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 you know, 
someone that's pushing papers and, and helping me get in the information I need. I, I think like you're saying earlier with your uh, a future panelist that's going to be uh, talking about the the fly and using AI to kind of help decode the brain. That's really, you know, that's what we've been needing for a while because we're now able with advances in technology to collect so much data, almost too much data to where, you know, you collect it and then it's in a database and it's like, wow, that's a lot of data. What do we do with it? Um, and I think having both, you know, the machine learning and AI approaches uh, kind of churn through it and and be able to pick out patterns that we pre that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see um, or just be able to deal with that much data and give us kind of, uh, you know, information that otherwise we wouldn't be able to get. I think it is going to, you know, revolutionize not just science, but, you know, our entire society. So I'm, you know, it's a little bit, I think, like everyone else, it's a little bit scary to be on the precipice of that big of a change. But it's also, uh, you know, absolutely exciting. I think, you know, hopefully if, you know, things sort of go right and we don't run into like a Terminator situation, we'll look back at, at this sort of time as being probably even more impactful than, you know, maybe even like the beginning of the internet age, <coughs> given given its impact in our life. I hope it's good too. I don't know. I'm yeah. on the fence. I use AI. I love it, but I'm watching it closely. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those where uh, for a long time, it seemed, you know, it just seemed like, oh yeah, AI, it's in all the scary movies. It's not really a threat. But I think now with the, the in this past year, I think everyone, everyone who uses it now kind of sees we're, we're not there by any means yet, but now I think it's gotten to the level where it's, you can see where it's going. Um, and you can see, you know, it, it, of course it could be scary, but I would like to believe, you know, it, lots of things we've invented in the past have been scary and we've, you know, done a decent job of trying to funnel it towards more productive uses. Um, you know, so fingers crossed on that. I'm not sure we could stop it if we wanted to, but you know, I, I it's certainly just on the, the positive side, I think it, it really could, it's going to revolutionize everything. And I, I, I do, you know, hope fingers crossed that it, it does that in a, a, in a very sort of positive way. I was I was skeptical up until recently when I realized that in academia there is so much controversy and you know uh, industry funded science uh, you know papers and stuff and so there's a lot of you know possible corruption and collusion and sure. problems within science itself and so to get to the bottom of stuff like are eggs good for you are is you know is our pesticides sure. really harmful there's a lot of controversy around some stuff so we will get a yeah. scientific consensus but we also might get robot police that you know wipe out humanity so we'll just yeah, to, yeah that's right we just have to <laughs> that might that's why where it might get a little bit scary yeah <laughs> now we'll just have to wait and see so um yeah that's not it la last question um and then i'll let you get back to your life uh sure what's on the horizon for you and what would you if you had you know the, the the mother of all grants or whatever what would you study what what's the burning question you're trying to figure out in your field oh wow, that's a deep one um yeah there's there's quite a few of my i would say you know it's it's still probably back to that uh you know if it's an infinite amount of money and an infinite amount of talented graduate students sure uh trying to really uh, you know not just explore that you know individuals respond to the same stressors in different ways and and demonstrate that but i think get a better understanding down at the kind of uh you know mechanistic level about why um you know what are the genetic what are the kind of uh you know, physiological the psychological like the full complete uh picture so you know having people operating out in the world in the real world with sensors on that we're able to collect this sort of information uh you know it's almost like a big brother sort of uh situation where we can collect all of that data and get a better understanding of how people are actually operating uh, in the real world under real stressors and how that uh kind of translates to uh kind of things like resilience um and at some level fundamentally what makes someone resilient or not uh, i think that's Certainly something I've become very interested in here recently and moving forward, uh, yeah, with infinite grant money or with no grant money, we'll probably do it anyways, try to uh, get to the bottom of, of what does that construct even mean uh, and how do we increase it? How do we make people uh, go from, you know, their current state of resilience to more? And I think, you know, that's just, that's a nebulous one. It's a, pr a particularly tricky one, but uh, it's certainly one that bounces around in my head for free all day long. Yeah. So, and then the end game is to, you know, improve the lives of, you know, people. That's the hope. Yeah. Um, you know, wonderful human being. Will you come back and do it again? What do you say? Absolutely. I'd love to. This has been a blast. Yeah. You are a brilliant human being. Wonderful to talk with. Uh, I want to thank Greg J. Norman, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Chicago. Um, look out for him on Google Scholar. He's going to be, you know, stirring the pot. He's going to be figuring out some stuff. Anything you want to add before we go? <laughs> Fingers crossed. I hope so.
All right. Thank you very much, Chris. All right. We'll talk right after this. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time.